It's a big day at one of America's last great manufacturers, Boeing. Is this a great day or what? Today, the most daring, anticipated, and scrutinized airplane in commercial aviation history, the Boeing 787 Dreamliner, is finally being delivered. We made it. We made it. Thank you for waiting for this day. This long-awaited milestone comes after nearly a decade of development, billions of dollars in overruns, and three years of agonizing delays. No wonder Boeing executives look relieved. There is no amount of rain in the world that can make this not the most fun day of the year. This is going to be an airplane that's going to change the world. Boeing promised a lot with the 787, from cutting-edge technology to comfort to industry-leading fuel economy. If it lives up to expectations, the plane could revolutionize the airline industry and earn Boeing billions of dollars in the process. But if the 787 fails to soar, it would be a corporate disaster. Will the gamble pay off? I'm Phil LeBeau, and this is Dreamliner, inside the world's most anticipated airplane. It's close to midnight, and Boeing workers are scrambling to bring another 787 together. We have some wire cutters on you. Come on forward. You know when you're good. The right side is in. Okay, you're clear. The plane being assembled tonight, Dreamliner number 41, will eventually be delivered to all Nippon Airways in Japan. You guys ready? All right, coming down. But right now, the focus is making sure the 47,000-pound wing fits with the fuselage. They all come up at the same time. They all join together at the same time. That you'll see about 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock in the morning. It all comes together at once. Yep. CNBC cameras were there for the 24 hours it took to bring Dreamliner number 41 together. A choreographed ballet of man and machine where the plane's seven major sections, from the nose to the tail, are tugged, hoisted, and ultimately fastened together by a team of Boeing machinists and supervisors like Dave Reese. Tomorrow morning by about 6 o'clock, this will be together to the dimension they need to install the track drill and get going. And by mid-morning, they'll have started to drill and install fasteners. So they're going to close this gap here and at the tail. Yep. And 41 will essentially look like a Dreamliner. It'll be pretty close, yeah. Reese will be the first to tell you the Dreamliner has, at times, been an engineering and manufacturing nightmare. I gotta come up. Just a little bit this way. Is it not fitting? Hiccups happen almost all the time. Uh, as a matter of fact, back in P1, we've got one of the tooling back there that currently has, keeps blowing and fuses, so we're gonna work through that. We've got electricians coming out and gonna take care of that. Hey, Tommy, what's that belt? It's good. Let's bring it in slow. We have issues that pop up all throughout the day, all the time. Perfect. The problems plaguing the Dreamliner have been well documented. It was supposed to be the aerospace giant's next big profit maker, but that dream is fast turning into a nightmare. Boeing has delayed the Dreamliner again. Engineers have found a glitch once again delaying delivery of hundreds of orders of aircraft. Welcome to the premiere of the 787 Dreamliner. Almost from the start, Boeing executives were too ambitious and too optimistic about how quickly they could deliver it. About once every generation the men and women of Boeing come together to fundamentally change even revolutionize air travel in fact when Boeing CEO Jim McNerney unveiled the mid-size widebody in 2007 he insisted the Dreamliner would be ready to fly on time even though the plane behind him was actually an empty shell assembled with temporary fasteners and missing key parts like all airplane programs this will be a scramble until the end but we have employees that get up at four in the morning and go to bed at two in the evening uh, who are committed to making it happen and that's what it takes mcnerney says the dreamliner will radically change what we expect in a commercial airplane for the plane's 250 passengers vaulted ceilings softer lighting bigger windows and larger overhead compartments for pilots a state-of-the-art flight deck but what makes this plane so revolutionary is something you can't see 
About half of the 787 is made of carbon fiber composite, a material that includes plastic, and yet is four times stronger and 40% lighter than aluminum, the material traditionally used to build airplanes. As a result, Boeing promises the Dreamliner will use 20% less fuel than comparable planes, a huge potential savings considering jet fuel is an airline's biggest expense. Is 20% the difference between profitability and losing money for some airlines? It could, it, it, absolutely. If you're an airline that depends on these mid-size wide bodies, it can make all the difference. But the promise of the 787 has been overshadowed by a maddening series of delays. Keep going, you got a long ways to go. For decades, Boeing has built most of its planes in the Seattle area, but not the Dreamliner. To save money and share some of the financial risk, Boeing decided to outsource nearly 70% of the plane's production to a virtual United Nations of partner suppliers from Italy, Japan, Korea, the UK, France, and other countries. Some of the biggest pieces made by suppliers, like the fuselage and wings, are loaded into an enlarged 747 known as the Dream Lifter, then flown into Seattle for final assembly. With so much work spread around the globe, the supply chain broke down. Some pieces made by suppliers didn't fit together. Others came in unfinished or out of sequence, creating huge log jams in Seattle. Gary Rager is a wing inspector who has been with the 787 program from day one. That was the thing, the uncertainty of not knowing how to do what you knew you were supposed to be doing. You know, because the, the guys that were writing the plans to tell you how to do it, they were uncertain also. The problems should not have been a surprise. In 2001, a Boeing engineer named John Hart Smith wrote a paper warning executives about the dangers of excessive outsourcing. He predicted it would actually increase costs, reduce profits, and that Boeing would spend a fortune helping subcontractors if they ran into trouble. That's exactly what happened. Boeing paid nearly a billion dollars to take over one plant that contributed to some of the 787's worst delays. Did anybody ever say, listen, we got an engineer here who thinks we're outsourcing too much or could possibly outsource too much? Obviously, there was a discussion about uh, where you draw the line in outsourcing and uh, versus doing it yourself. We thought we were making the right decision back then, and I think the people understood the risks but thought they were manageable. Did you underestimate the financial impact those decisions would have ultimately? Well, I think the uh, financial model has a lot more pressure on it than we first anticipated. So how did Boeing get the Dreamliner back on track? In large part, it was due to this man, Pat Shanahan. A year ago, we were disassembling the horizontal to do some engineering rework. In 2007, the career Boeing executive was given a monumental order, fix the Dreamliner. A year ago, you would have been working on this horizontal stabilizer? Well, we would have been taking it apart. Literally rebuilding it. Rebuilding it. Shanahan's first action, flush out the problems with suppliers. Did you ever stop and say to yourself, this is nuts? This is not how you efficiently build an aircraft? Well, we knew it was inherently inefficient. I mean, we really understand what efficient looks like, and that's the way the supply chain was designed. Did some of our partners not have the capability we needed? In some cases. Some of the biggest problems came from some of the smallest parts, the tens of thousands of fasteners used to hold the plane together. When the wings first arrived from Japan on airplane number one, you knew you had a fastener that wasn't going to stand because they would paint it red. That told you it was temporary. Almost all the fasteners were red. Some of the suppliers didn't do the proper preparation, so we had to remove thousands and thousands of fasteners and rework the airplane right here. You had to double work. You had to take it out and then double work, and sometimes put it back even in. triple work, and I think that's where it was just really frustrating. One problem that threatened to put the entire program on hold had nothing to do with suppliers, a potentially serious structural flaw. During a critical test like this, in which the wings are bent to their most extreme limits, Boeing engineers saw something alarming. Layers of their revolutionary composite material began to pull apart. But after months of study, engineers found a way to reinforce the wing without having to redesign it. We have 
two titanium fittings that we put along a giant rib in order to reinforce the wing and add strength. Okay. And it was as simple as that. As simple as that, but it was key. We didn't have to stop the line. We didn't have to do a major redesign. It could have been a showstopper. The 787 team has seen plenty of potential showstoppers, and they've been costly. It's estimated Boeing has spent between 17 and 23 billion dollars developing and building the Dreamliner. Was it a waste? Not according to Wall Street analyst Heidi Wood. Here's where we need to be fair. We can see the overrun now. We cannot see the brilliance of the plane yet, but I would argue that if we were looking in 2022 and looking backwards, we will probably applaud and say that this is yet again one of the best planes that Boeing has ever designed. So far, 56 customers have ordered more than 800 Dreamliners, the most successful launch of a new commercial plane in Boeing history, and a leg up on its chief rival, Airbus. But some analysts say Boeing will have to sell a thousand planes before it recoups its investment. Still, Wood insists the 787 will prove to be a lucrative plane for decades to come. The 787 is without a doubt going to be a game changer. Every airline quickly realized what happens if their competitors are flying the 787, what is going to happen to their passengers? That is why there was such a thundering demand for the plane, and it was like dominoes. I know it's raining, but is this cool or what? Boeing executives can smile now. The new plane is finally going into service. But it may be years before Boeing knows if the 787 is a dreamliner come true. What do you think the 787 has done to Boeing's reputation? Well, it's hurt our reputation. I mean, I think that's the frustrating part about this project. You know, now we have to demonstrate we can build and deliver the airplanes and support them as promised. But it's set us back. Setbacks that don't end with the first flight. Up next, battling public perception. Can one plane really change the way we feel about flying? The airline don't care nothing about you. Lost my luggage. No one's helping me. It's a complete disaster. What the Dreamliner may mean for you when we come back. December 15, 2009. Now. The moment of truth for the 787 Dreamliner as it climbs into the sky for the time. The day is overcast, but the maiden flight is picture perfect to Boeing executives. To see that thing move along was just exciting. And then when it lifted off, it was just fantastic. This is the first of more than a thousand test flights for the Dreamliner. For the next 20 months, a fleet of six will be put through a grueling menu of abuse. From dragging the tail on the ground, to slamming on the brakes, to enduring hundreds of stalls to see how well it recovers. Lafon 78, turn left heading 07. Pilots wrench the controls to make the wings shudder and land the plane in 35 mile an hour crosswinds severe enough to close most airports. On the ground, they're literally frozen to minus 45 degrees, then baked to 115, and frozen again. The way I would think Siberia would be, definitely cold. The goal? To ensure the plane flies safely and reliably. But with the 787, Boeing is promising something more, something dramatic, to change the very way it feels to fly. So when you walk in here, first thing I notice is it's wide open. Yeah, I hope so. That's what we want you to notice. We want Boeing's you to Blake Emery has spent nearly a decade studying what people want from the moment they step aboard. The main thing we're after as someone crosses the threshold is to have a psychological break from everything that went before. The parking, the traffic, the security lines, the rush sense of uh, trying to make your plane. So we walk in here and you want us to have a different feeling. Exactly. Back there. Emery took us through the cabin to explain some of the psychology behind the 787's design. 
we think a lot of your perception inside the airplane is based on how you perceive the width of the airplane literally at your eye level. And so we do everything we can to push the width of the airplane out at that level. It doesn't enter into your thinking consciously, but it enters into your thinking unconsciously. This is the Dreamliner Gallery, where airlines choose their seats, galleys, even laboratories. All part of outfitting a brand new plane designed to make you feel better in the air. The windows are 65% bigger, intended to give passengers a better view of the horizon. Forget the plastic shades. These windows dim at the touch of a button. There's soothing, multicolored lighting that gradually adjusts to change the mood on long flights. And passengers should feel more comfortable, Boeing says, because the cabin will have more oxygen, less dry air, and be quieter than any comparable jetliner. You've made a number of improvements, but at the end of the day, will they truly appreciate all the little nuances of the Dreamliner? Most people are gonna say, I really like the windows, and they will, and that'll be true but there's gonna be a lot more going on besides the windows that you can't even see that we did on this airplane. And you're just gonna feel better and you're not gonna know why. Have your tickets on ready? Making passengers feel better is a pretty tall order considering how miserable air travel is today. $250, I don't bargain. The truth is for millions of us who are herded like cattle through clogged airports and into packed planes, then spend countless hours in the air, flying stinks. The airline don't care nothing about you. They care about making money in their pocket. Lost my luggage. No one's helping me. It was wretched. The worst experience of my life. It was ruined by the delays and the closing. You don't want to go near the airline. It's a complete disaster. It's hard to believe people used to think flying was fun and glamorous. But can any one airplane help bring that magic back? United CEO Jeff Smyzik is betting on it. His airline has ordered 50 787s at a cost of roughly $8 billion and will be the first in the U.S. to fly them. Do you think it's one of those planes where once you start to get several into your fleet, that people will say, I want to take the Dreamliner. Oh, our customers will be looking for that, and our customers will be looking to United versus our competitors because they know we'll have the aircraft and our competitors won't. Smyzik believes passengers will appreciate the 787's innovations, but only if they get good service. If you're not getting good customer service, you won't enjoy the flight. If you do get good customer service, you will enjoy the flight. And you and I know the difference between good customer service and bad customer service. And Unfortunately, it's only getting worse. A University of Michigan survey ranks airlines dead last among 47 industries. That one's overweight by nine pounds. To ask people to describe their ideal flying experience in economy class, they say, there's no one in the seat next to me and I slept all the way. So you finally realize, oh, I get it. People don't want to experience your product at all. So the strategic decision it gives you is, do you just figure out how to have people sleep? Do you just figure out what gas to pump into the cabin so you knock them out and wake them up like a dentist, you know, when, when they're at their destination? So when something goes wrong, that's when things hit the fan. Aviation consultant Michael Boyd blames it all on the airlines. We are in a system that has a lot of rules. And instead of being somebody to help us get through the rules, very often airline employees are more like, like guards at a minimum security prison. They've got a way to go on that. As a frequent flyer himself, Boyd is looking forward to taking the 787. But he's skeptical it will be the game changer airlines are promising. I think they're trying to make an airplane that is more comfortable. But the reality, when you sit on the airplane after you're boarded, and see the, you know, the, the pretty blue on the walls and all that, you still have 17 and a half inches for your rear end to get to Tokyo. That's gonna be the bottom line of the whole thing. I mean, it's possible to be in a situation where the seats are so tight together that I don't care how cool I make the bins or the lighting, it's not gonna, <laughs> it's not gonna help. Right. It's, just like if, it's just like if a flight attendant treats you bad. Phil, I can't design a window that's gonna take care of that. <laughs> Some of Boeing's newest planes have no windows at all. Up next, a tiny warplane that fights without weapons for a pilot. When we come back.
It happens every three seconds. A Boeing plane takes off somewhere in the world. At any given moment, nearly a half million people are flying in one. But there's another Boeing plane that doesn't carry a single passenger. The Scan Eagle weighs less than a packed suitcase, costs roughly a hundred grand, and is the new darling of Boeing's $32 billion a year defense division. Some of Boeing's most important defense research is done here, in Oregon's Columbia River Gorge, home to a free-spirited defense contractor named Charlie Guthrie. Harebrained ideas uh, come from all corners of the company, and many of those really pan out. Guthrie is chief technology officer at in situ, the Boeing subsidiary that makes the Scan Eagle. Okay, so commonality, commonality, interchangeability, and we. He spent most of his career developing weapons, but the Scan Eagle doesn't carry any. It's a drone, what the military calls an unmanned aerial vehicle, or UAV. Undetectable at 2,000 feet. It uses video and thermal imaging to track enemy movements and pinpoint weapons they've just used, all while staying aloft for 24 hours at a time. The Scan Eagle, at virtually moments notices, it can be launched, it can get out to the area that it needs to be. The folks on the ground don't know it's there, so they don't change what they're doing. Guthrie took us to Oregon's high desert to fly Boeing's tiny eye in the sky. Setting it up takes literally a minute. No tools required. Just the tug of a cord. Three, two, one. Wow. Look at that. The robotic bird is controlled from a mobile command unit as it patrols the sky above us. It's been about three minutes since we launched the Scan Eagle, and I can't see it anywhere. And I can't even hear it, but one thing is for sure, the Scan Eagle can see me. The Scan Eagle sees a lot. At any given time, there are nearly two dozen of them over hot spots like Iraq, Afghanistan, and Libya. U.S. Navy SEALs used it to help rescue Captain Richard Phillips from Somali pirates in 2009. Thanks, guys. Yep. Thank you very much. When you saw that mission take place and you realized the role that Scan Eagle played, what did you think? It was a quiet acknowledgement around the company, and we knew we could talk about it a lot until we were given permission to. And then when you heard that it played out successfully? Oh, it was a, it was a celebration here. Boeing has helped the U.S. wage war for nearly a century. B-17s helped cripple Nazi Germany. And two B-29s, including the Enola Gay, dropped the atomic bombs that put an end to World War II. In the 60s and 70s, the B-52 carpet bombed Vietnam, and it's still in service today. With aircraft like the F-15 and F-18 fighter jets, Apache helicopter, and C-17 cargo plane, defense earns fully one half of Boeing's annual revenues. While the bottom line has soared, the company's reputation has taken some big hits. 100 air refueling tankers from Boeing as a growing scandal over that deal has led to the firing of two top Boeing officials. In the late 90s and early 2000s, Boeing's defense division was embroiled in several scandals, all in an attempt to gain financial advantage in major government contracts. It has been the worst, sleaziest ripoff of the taxpayers that I have ever seen in my 21 years here. Nick Schwellenbach is with the Project on Government Oversight a nonprofit watchdog group. The common theme here is ethical shortcuts, not doing the right thing to get a leg up over your competitors. Like the infamous scandal of 2003, when Boeing won a $20 billion contract to replace Air Force refueling tankers. One of Boeing's top executives essentially bribed one of the Air Force's top procurement officials to steer a large contract their way in exchange for a job with Boeing. A crime that ended with the Air Force official and Boeing CFO in jail. At a high level within the company, there was a message that came down. Um, it's okay to do things 
uh, without a sense of fair play. And they got busted, and they got busted in a hardcore way. Jim McNerney, CEO since 2005, doesn't deny there were scandals, but he says those days are history. You've been on the board since 2001. You've seen the scandals that have happened. What went wrong? I think uh, uh, people didn't know what the rules were. Now, that's no excuse. And I think that uh, there were some historical ways of behaving that were no longer tolerated in, in the world that we all found ourselves in, in 2000, 2001. When I ended up uh, taking over the company, I think the, uh, the single most important thing on my mind was to make it absolutely clear what behaviors are tolerated and what aren't. Since McNerney took over, Boeing has had no major ethics scandals. And in early 2011, the company won the Air Force tanker contract with a new bid that withstood harsh scrutiny. Welcome news in an era that promises shrinking defense budgets. To face that challenge, Boeing is developing new drones in its secretive St. Louis facility called Phantom Works. There's the Phantom Ray, an unmanned stealth fighter. And the Phantom Eye, a spy plane designed to cruise for four days at 65,000 feet. Like the Scan Eagle, they're meant to give Boeing's defense division a lift with new, sometimes unorthodox ideas. Do you have a crazy idea in the past that at the time you thought, that's ridiculous, that'll never work? Probably the first one, and, and still one of the most important for the company, is the way we pick the airplane out of the air on a rope. When I first saw that, I thought, this'll never work. <laughs> but it does. The Scan Eagle can be retrieved without a runway, a low-tech breakthrough that makes Guthrie grin. You've seen a lot of things in your career, Bowen, <laughs> but you, you get a smile watching this. I've spent the majority of my career trying to figure out how to blow stuff up. Did pretty good at it, and uh, this is a whole different career, a whole different look at things and figuring out how to save lives and, and guard our troops. Up next, after years of delay, the 787 is finally ready for its debut. But are the airlines? Yeah, I'm seeing a little oil right there. Scrambling to welcome the Dreamliner when we return. a.m. on a sweltering July morning, and nearly a thousand people are gathered at Tokyo's Haneda Airport, waiting for a glimpse of the newest star to hit Japan. Hold upon 7 8, contact Tokyo. The celebrity four, three, isn't five. someone on board, it's the plane itself. The all new Boeing 787 Dreamliner, arriving in Japan for the very first time. Welcome to Japan! At the controls, a veteran captain named Masayuki Ishii, who can't believe the crowd waiting for him. After landing, I saw many, so many people taking a picture for us. I was really touched. I was really moved. This must be a once in my life experience. The scene repeats across Japan, in cities like Osaka and Nagoya. Wherever the plane lands, Hundreds cram rooftops and line fences waiting for hours to greet the new plane. When I grow up, I want to be a pilot. But the Dreamliner isn't here just for show. The plane, at this point still experimental, is here for a week-long, 24-hour-a-day dress rehearsal. All Nippon Airways, or ANA, is the first customer in line waiting to receive the 787. And this is its first chance to put the plane through its paces before Boeing hands over the keys. During this exhaustive tour, ANA will fly in and out of airports around the country and practice servicing the plane around the clock. As Boeing mechanics and engineers share their know-how with the plane's future owners. See, they've already fixed it. You see how this is? The tour is also part photo op. But the smiles and handshakes can't hide the fact the plane is late. 
three years late. ANA was banking on all the customers and fuel savings the plane was supposed to deliver starting back in 2008. That leaves Boeing executive Jim Elbaugh performing some delicate diplomacy with ANA CEO Shinichiro Ito. We acknowledge that, that we're late on this airplane and we know that we've had an impact on ANA. And as a result, we've made an accommodation and we don't discuss the details of any settlement that we might have. Back in 2004, ANA wasn't even sure it wanted the 787. It questioned whether a plane made primarily out of carbon fiber composite could withstand the daily beating. Boeing sales director Joe McAleer recalls an alarming conversation with ANA's chief engineer. He was concerned about uh, what we call ramp rash in the industry, the interaction between baggage carts and catering trucks and sides of airplanes. His main concern was whether the airlines would be able to detect and repair these small dings and dents. ANA is an extraordinarily technically competent airline, and if they weren't going to endorse composites in our new airplane, it's highly unlikely anybody else was. To win over skeptical engineers at ANA, Boeing sent them a piece of carbon fiber composite like this and told them to have at it with a hammer. After repeated attempts, they couldn't even make a dent. It's official. Just a few months later, ANA ordered 50 Dreamliners. It's the largest launch order in history. Although the sticker price at the time was $120 million each, it's believed ANA received a substantial discount, perhaps as much as 50%. In a way, the 787's arrival in Japan is a homecoming. That's because more than a third of the plane is made here by suppliers like Kawasaki, Fuji, and Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, all part of a complex global supply chain that has threatened to bring the project to its knees. But now that the Dreamliner is finally on its way, there's relief among workers like 33-year-old Tak Kawaguchi. He works at Mitsubishi, constructing the 787's wings. There were a lot of skeptics who looked at this idea of building wings in Japan, sending them to the U.S., putting them together. They said, this is a bad idea. Well, I feel that Boeing respects our technology here at Mitsubishi. Now that the Dreamliner is about to be delivered, I expect that the airlines, as well as the passengers, will value this plane and we can prove the assembly process was correct. Days later at Nagoya Airport, Kawaguchi and hundreds of his co-workers get a chance to see the Dreamliner up close for the very first time. It's a moment Kawaguchi's waited years for. And when he finally sees it, he's blown away. Like a proud parent, he delights in every detail, even the lavatory. <laughs> But the real highlight comes when he finally emerges and walks under one of the wings he helped build. This is the first time to see the rear wing with the whole aircraft. And you're proud to be a part of it? Yes, of course. The end of an epic journey from a Seattle drawing board to the skies over Japan, with plenty of turbulence along the way. They need to have loyalty to the workforce because we are the ones that make them great. A long-standing relationship gets tense. We asked for a number of things. The no-strike clause was one of them, and we just couldn't reach an agreement. And workers lose sleep over jobs. We can shut this company down! When Dreamliner returns. planes at Boeing is getting a new lease on life. The 747-8 Intercom, the newest and largest version of the company's iconic jumbo jet, is taking off for the first time.
of the day is especially sweet for this man, a 90-year-old retired Boeing engineer named Joe Sutter. He was the chief designer of the original 747. Somebody would have told you way back when, 40 years ago, that you'd be out here on a day like this. It's a little hard to imagine a program would last this long, but it started out right and uh, to fit the market, and it still fits the market. Okay. Runway 24, right? Taxi, route one. The 747 shows what Boeing excels at. Not just designing planes, but reinventing them. Keeping older models like the 747 modern and profitable. I always say there's no such thing as a routine test flight. Dennis O'Donohue is Boeing's chief test pilot. Today we'll intentionally fly outside the envelope of the airplane. O'Donohue's role is key to updating the 747, an expensive undertaking, but still a bargain compared to creating a completely new model. He puts the plane through a series of severe maneuvers. I'd like to move on to doing the roller coaster. Tossing engineers into near weightlessness. Okay, here comes a little bit of a push. Here comes a little bit of a pull. It's phenomenal to come back at this point in a development program and have no issues with the airplane. It's ready to go fly right now. Test flights, rollouts, and deliveries are milestones in Seattle. Moments of pride passed down from one generation to another. The story of Boeing is one of amazing feats of engineering, but it's also the story of the people who build the planes, workers like Dina Bartman, who have Boeing in their blood. Boeing was in my family. My dad worked there, my mom worked there, they both retired, my sister worked there, and it was, you get hired at Boeing and you have a career. Bartman is one of 80,000 Boeing workers here in Seattle. More than a third of them are plane builders who belong to the International Aerospace Machinist Union. Do you guys have enough training plans for... Without the union, Bartman says, her life would be harder. Everything would be lower. It'd be a lower standard of living than what I have right now. After 22 years at Boeing, she makes $67,000 a year. We're not begging for our next meal, but we're not getting rich on the other hand either. The machinists have built Boeing's plane since 1935. Today, they find themselves at the center of a fierce union battle. We can shut this company down! The union has gone on strike five times in the last 30 years, a contentious relationship that only grew worse when Boeing opened a second assembly line for its hot new 787 here in Charleston, South Carolina, at a non-union shop where production cannot be stopped by a strike. In 2010, Jim Elbaugh, president of Boeing Commercial Airplanes, said the company decided not to build the additional plant in Washington due to concerns over union troubles, a statement that has come back to haunt him. The overriding factor was not the, uh, the business climate, and it was not the, the wages we're paying people today. It was that we can't afford to have a work stoppage you know, every three years. Now that and other statements are at the heart of a government complaint that Boeing has violated federal law. Catherine Fisk is a professor at the University of California at Irvine Law School. When a company transfers work or decides to expand production in one location rather than in another and does it to discriminate against the employees who supported the union, that's illegal. Did Boeing open the 787 plant in Charleston to strike back against the union in Seattle? The National Labor Relations Board thinks so. It wants the company to shut that line and move those jobs back to Washington State. But that demand has sparked a furious backlash from the right. Has America got nuts? This complaint is a dangerous road to go down. It's an attack on states that work hard. Boeing has called the NLRB case frivolous and Elbaugh is standing his ground. Being a supplier that our customers can count on uh, to deliver the airplanes and not have repeated work stoppages was, was something that I said, and, and I'll say it again. So you don't regret saying that? No. 
Union officials told CNBC they offered Boeing labor peace through the year 2020, but they say Boeing walked away from the table. When we talk with the machinists, one of the things they say is, listen, we told them we'll guarantee that there's not going to be a work stoppage for 10 years, and Boeing said that wasn't good enough. Is that true? Well, we have a little difference of opinion on that one. We asked for a number of things. The uh, uh, no-strike uh, clause was one of them, and we just couldn't reach an agreement. For workers like Dina Bartman, the real fear is Boeing will gradually move more and more production out of Seattle. <sighs> you don't feel secure anymore because you're slowly watching your job be taken away. Things being outsourced to other places that it should be staying here. I think everybody's afraid every day of losing their job. Job security is also a concern in Charleston, where workers consider Boeing an economic godsend. Two years ago, Kia Johnson was out of work. I applied for Boeing, of course, because Boeing was the next big thing for Charleston and South Carolina, as well as the economy took a turn for the worse. Now, she's one of the thousand employees here counting on a future at Boeing. I just was trying to make sure I had a job, stability for my family. The case may take years to resolve. However, it turns out it will touch thousands of workers, affect dozens of airlines, and involve billions of dollars. In this business, the margin of error can be as thin as the air at 40,000 feet. And even when a gamble pays off big, as the new 787 Dreamliner may, it's often measured in painful lessons learned, deadlines missed, budgets blown, all in pursuit of a gleaming jetliner for a new generation. It's gratifying that we got the product right. I think what got underestimated was the uh, ability to do it. You were too ambitious. Yeah, I think that's the story. I think we reached too far. My mother called me up once and said, well, what's it like working on the 787? I told her it's like being in the rodeo. If you don't mind getting your ribs broken and your lungs crushed, it's a hell of a ride. This has been a hell of a ride. I'm Phil LeBeau. Thanks for watching.